Everything God has ever done, and you're going to see it and hear it over and over this morning, he's done it through people. If he's known, he's known because people have revealed him somehow. He has used people to expose himself to a finite world because he's infinite. We are the body of Christ. We are God's dwelling place. The lens, you could say, through which he is seen. Praise the Lord. We, we're not seeing God manifest himself in, in a visible way on any regular basis or in any way that the average person would be able to identify with. I know we hear testimonies from time to time, somebody saw God, but I'm talking about normally. We are the, we're the lens, we're the means by which people can see that there is a God. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 33. And there's a reason for this, and that's what God is trying to get us to understand. That this has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with religion. Religion was great when we didn't have God's presence. Religion was great when, you know, when, uh, when we didn't have his uh, life living in us. When we needed to know we needed God and didn't know how to get him. It made us aware that we had a need for God. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard and live? Remember this is, this is uh, when he's referring back to, to when God spoke to Israel. And there was quaking and shaking and they were freaking out and the smoke and the fire and they said, you talk to him. We don't want to talk to him. He's, he's scaring us. He's scary. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard and live? That's what they were scared of because they knew if God shows up, somebody's going to die. Yeah. There's a reason for this, right? Look at Exodus chapter 19 and verse 17 through 19. Exodus Chapter 19, verses 17 through 19. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. I don't believe that's it. Exodus 19, chapter 19, 17 through 19. Praise the Lord. Exodus 19, verse 17 through 19. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Praise the Lord. Speaking from the midst of the fire. Now this church is an event that foreshadowed the eternal word becoming flesh and dwelling among us and ultimately dwelling in us. This is God pointing to the... That's what I was talking about with all the stuff I was talking about this morning with the patriarchs and everything that may have just sounded random, but I'm saying everything in this Bible is pointing to God and us, connection, the connection between God and us as believers. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And, you know, because God is, this isn't history to him. It's only history to us. It's now to God. Everything is now to him. So who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, if you can, back up to verse 6 again. Now, what, here's what I want you to see. 
And I've thought about this and prayed about this, and so, you, you know, if you've got a problem with it, that's fine. We all got our opinions. But Jesus was operating as a human being here. He's a man. He never related, I mean, 90% of the time he talked about him being the son of man. And he said, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So here's the point I'm making. Any theology that promotes God as completely transcendent or uh, disconnected or beyond any kind of an analogy you could make to men is bogus. He didn't want to be identified that way. God is inherent and involved with the finite or with us, people in time and space. Although he transcends all that, he never relates or never wants to be related to as something beyond this. The highest, the holiest, the perfection of God will make him seem distant. It'll make it seem like he's outside of us, that he's far away from us, that he's unknowable to us. Isaiah 9 and 6, and religion has reinforced that. When in fact everything God was doing was trying to identify with us and us to identify with him. Unto us a son is born. Right? A child is given. Isaiah 9 and 6. The government shall be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Son. A child. The government. Incarnation theology manifests it's, it's manifesting the humility and the nearness of God and His empathy with us. He became Emmanuel, God with us, to share our mortal condition. But it's more than that. It's also that we could share His divine condition. We've kept it down here and He's showing us this side so that we can believe for the other side. He, he diminished himself. He came to this human level. Why, we wonder. He's God. He did it to no pain. <laughs> you got to wonder, you know. To experience the wounds of sin. Not to sin, but to experience the consequences of it. To be abandoned. To be alienated. To be forsaken. Imagine. This is what God chose to experience. And you think he doesn't care about you? You think he isn't interested in humanity? He wanted to be a human. He wanted to experience humanity. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. God is so, so much more and so different than we have believed him to be, I think, in many cases, in most cases. I'm speaking for me. You all may have some revelation. I, I don't have, and that's, that's great if you do. I'm just saying, for me, this, what God is showing me is just a complete game changer. In ways I'm talking about in the depth that I'm trying to understand it. That he's trying to reveal it to me, I should say. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord is one. Both in the sense of being exalted over everything. But also in the sense of being compassionately involved in everything. It isn't just about him having control of everything. It's about him being under the control of all things as well. He placed himself there. Praise the Lord. Philippians 2 and 8.
It's, it's more than him just doing the miraculous and the supernatural. Being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. See, it's God's own nullification of himself for the sake of us, for the sake of truth and for the sake of love. That's, what, that's what's critical to understand. He nullified his own power, his own dominion, his own control. How many of us would do that? <laughs> don't answer. I just know I don't, I don't like to give up control. Praise the Lord. The eternal made these flesh bridges. He, he made a, a, a flesh way of covering the gaps, the things that were separating us from him. We couldn't get to him. The Jews proved it, and we've all done our share of trying as well. Keep the law. Be perfect. Can't be done. We couldn't get to him. We couldn't bridge that gap. So he did. He nullified himself. Instead of us being elevated, instead of us elevating ourselves to some level of, of perfection and, and you know, uh, spirituality or divinity, he gave his up so that we could relate, so that he could connect with us and we could connect with him. God with us, bridging the gap between the realm of the infinitely transcendent God and the finite world of lost people. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Romans 11, verse 36. I'm saying all of this because there's a, there's a flip to this as well. There's a flip side to this. But without understanding this, we can never know what it is God's really trying to do. He wants us to know He was a man. Yes. He was... He was able to nullify his godhood, his godliness, his divinity, and become one of us. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So there's no place, no place, there is no place that God doesn't reign and have preeminence. David even said, if I make my bed in hell, he'll find me. He's got, he can be anywhere and everywhere because he is. Amen. God created us in his image. Yes. Attributing humanship and characteristics to God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Well, I'm not just talking about spiritually. There's something about God that looks like us. Yes. He's attributing that. We think, well, it's just because Jesus came as a man. No, I'm talking about God, the invisible God. God reveals himself in human terms, using human language, expressing human emotions. I mean, if this doesn't stir you, you're not hearing what I'm hearing. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. He communicates with me on my level because he wants to. Yes. But he has made it possible through that for me then to communicate with him on his level. Come on. Deuteronomy 34 and 10. This is the thing that Abraham found. This is the thing that Moses found. God said, am I going to go in there and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah without talking to my friend about it first? My friend, not my servant. Not my creation, my friend, an equal. That's what friends are. You can't, be, you can't have a friend and be superior, right? You can't really have a friend and totally control everything like I was talking about earlier. You gotta, you gotta relinquish something or you don't have friends. There arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses whom the Lord knew face to face, man to man, human to human. That's how he knew him. He knew him as a man. And that's what Israel didn't understand. Why was Moses not afraid? Because he knew God face to face. He knew him on a human level, in other words. Not that he didn't know he was God, but you understand what I'm saying? God had 
brought himself down to a place where, where Moses could relate to him on a natural friend level. But when he showed up to Israel not having that same relationship, all they could see was fire, smoke, and the fear of death. Shaken. Praise the Lord. Face to face. And here's what God is showing us in all of this. The Word of God always has to take human form. It's irrelevant without that. It has, no, it has no power. It has no access, you could say. John 1, 14. The, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word made flesh. Why? For the sake of human beings who live in a flesh and blood reality. Who don't know anything else. Sinai is where the Word of God came to Moses. Bethlehem is where it came to all of us. The Lord God was clothed with human skin, our flesh, and our bones. The miracle of the Incarnation is the absolute paradox. The infinite and the finite meet in the mystery of this divine presence. And I hope you're hearing what I'm saying because this happens in our lives as well. God came down to be a human. Because he wanted us to experience both sides of who we are. All of what we are. God, there had to be human attributes in God for God to create us in his image because he didn't just create us spirits he gave us that God side the spirit side but you got to be born again for that but there's attributes of God there's a, a reality of God that we've never even really thought about I don't think for the most part because it's never talked about that God created us in his image he created us to look like him. Yeah. And him to look like us. Let's look at Romans 11.36. Did we? If we didn't, let's do it. If we did, let's go back and read it again. There isn't any place that God doesn't rule and reign where God is not. He reveals Himself on human levels all the time, constantly. For of Him, through Him, and to Him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. He, co he comes, God touches a leper. He eats with sinners and prostitutes. He sheds human tears. Jesus wept. He suffers heartache. Loses loved ones. Like all humans. The Lord is God over every and all possible worlds. And that includes both the celestial realms of the heavenlies as well as the world of the fallen the world of the shamed, the world of the alienated, the world of the lost. Praise God. God's infinite condescension reveals and adds to the majesty of His infinite transcendence. The Word became flesh. The greatest expression of God's Word is Jesus, obviously. The Word of God that tabernacles with us. Hebrews 1, 2.
In the past, God spoke to us by his prophets, right? That's what the scripture says. After these last days, though, he spoke to us by his son, whom he hath the appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. By his son. That literally translates, he spoke to us in son. God spoke the language of son. Of humans is what he's saying. Hebrews 12, 27 through 29. Hebrews 12, 27 through 29. Remember now, remember Sinai? Moses spoke to him face to face. He was a friend, like a friend. Everybody else, the shaking. Everything was shaken. They were freaked out, right? And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. The difference between the flesh and the spirit, the difference between humanity and the born-again person. Because everything that can be shaken, in other words, everything that ain't of God, it's going to get shook loose, it's going to die, it's going to be decayed, it's going to, all that's going to happen. But if you're born again, you can't be shaken. You're a friend of God. You're a child of God. You have that face-to-face -face relationship like Moses had. You don't have to be afraid of anything. And th but wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Godly fear. That's not freaked out and afraid that he's going to get me. That's respect. Like you would have for any relationship, any friendship. Praise the Lord. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 33. You could even go as far as to say, what, what happened in Acts 2.38? The whole place was shaken. And they heard a sound like a rushing mighty wind, like the sound of a trumpet blast, you know? And they were all filled with the presence of God. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard and lived? With tongues of fire, he spoke. Now we're talking about an implied incarnational theology, without which, there would be no language that we could comprehend about God, that we could understand God with. No way we could recognize him or understand him, the infinite one who transcends all things, if he didn't find a language, a human language, that we could use to relate to him with. Think about it. Just think about it. This is God Almighty now. He doesn't have to do anything. This is His choice. But think of all the metaphors when you look through the Bible. God sees. Does God see? I suppose He does from a human perspective. But He doesn't have eyeballs that He needs to... I mean, how would that work? If He could see everything, how big would those eyeballs have to be? You know what I'm saying? He's using human metaphors to help us relate and understand. God hears. Of course he does. But he doesn't hear like we do. Or how could he hear everybody's prayers at the same time and be able to identify each one without having to stop and quit listening to this one and listen to that one? He uses human metaphors. It's the only way we could relate to it. If he just talked like the truth is for him from the spiritual perspective... We'd just be standing there like a blank slate. We wouldn't have a clue what in the world is he talking about. I don't, know, I don't know if there's a language that could be used to describe it that we could ever relate to, I'm talking about. Because it's got to be, when we go to heaven, we just know all things. We know stuff. We, we're not learning stuff. We're not sitting down and hearing a lesson. We'll just know because we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of God. We are operating totally in the God realm. Where now we're operating in both. How 
the hand of God. <laughs> the hand of God. He stretches out his arm. How long is that arm? How big is the hand? You see what I'm saying? He's using human metaphors so that we can talk, so we can communicate. This is what I'm saying. The spirit that imparts revelation does it inside a human brain. It's translated into human apprehension or, or human understanding. Jesus is the substance of this, call it shadow talk or shadowy talk. It's analogical language between God and humans, how we can make the analogies. He embodies God's life before us. God touching us, God knowing us, God healing us. Jesus, the firstborn of many brethren. How many of you know that have brothers or sisters. No, you may not look identical, but you have the same genealogical, physiological uh, DNA. You're made the same. You have the same potentials. You have the same basic uh, opportunity for intellectual advancement and emotional growth and everything else. Why? Because, because you're family, because you're brothers. You got the same stuff going on in you. The same potential is available to each one. Now, everybody makes choices, and that can change some stuff. But I'm saying what Jesus is telling us is we have the same potential, the same ability, the same opportunity to be what Jesus is. And to do anything less is a choice, whether we understand that or not. Sometimes not making a choice is a choice, right? I mean, if, if you choose not to do anything, you're making a choice whether you realize it or not. God speaks from the midst of the fire that's revealed at Zion and at Bethlehem. Look at Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 2 through 4. Just, I, I touched on it briefly just a moment ago, but I want you to see it in the Word of God. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven, the same kind of sound I, I suspect that they heard at Mount Sinai as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. They saw fire, they saw shaking, they heard the wind, they heard the howl, right? They were filled with God. This is to reveal to us that we are more than flesh and blood. This wasn't God just flying over. This was God coming to make a home, to find residence. We are spirits manifested in flesh. 1 John 4, 17. It's not fantasy. It's not a hopeful or wishful thought. It is what God is trying to explain to us through everything from His creation, from forming us in His image, to give us the, the understanding, the analogy, the metaphors of, of we are God's children. We are children of God. We don't have a problem believing that or understanding that in re relative to Jesus. Why do we have a problem with us? Let me tell you something. Our born again, our born from heaven experience is just as miraculous as a virgin giving birth. It takes faith. It takes somebody to believe God. Yeah. Look around. The world is full. Of human bodies. Without God. Without any divine presence. Without any divine power. With nothing but their own ability. Their own strength. Their own deceptive qualities. And, and so forth. Which is why they're in the Ukraine. It's why they're, you know, Afghanistan. It's, it's why all of it. Why? We want to be gods. 
but we don't know how. So we think being God is, is being able to kill everybody else or control everybody else or manipulate everybody else. It's in everybody to want to have that reality. But it's for the same reason they don't have it. Just like Nimrod, the Tower of Babel. Let them go and they'll destroy everything. They'll become gods. They'll, they'll become what it is they're trying to become without the God nature. Just the power desire for. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. As God is, so are we in this world. And we read this all the time and we go, praise the Lord, but do we really think about it? Do we really meditate on this? He wouldn't have put that in there if he didn't want us to believe this, if he didn't want us to, to embrace this. I think we're afraid that, you know, we'll be like the, the, the Pharisees would say, he's making himself God. No, he's not. God did. God made him God. I'm not making myself God. I'm not trying to promote myself as God. He's already told me that I am. Unlimited by the confines of space and time, your spirit sees a reality that your mind cannot fathom. Your spirit knows stuff that you can't figure out. And from that vision comes down the power to face the challenges of a dark and, and corrupt and confusing world. It's a vision, a vision of God, a higher vision. But think, just think with me for a minute. A higher vision means, by definition, that there has to be, there must be two visions. At least, if there's a higher one, higher than what? Higher than the one that's not as high, right? So there has to be two and not one. There is you and there is the vision that you perceive. And if there are two, two can be separated. I'm talking about humanity here, guys, if I'm not making myself clear, because I, I, I may not be, I'm not trying to be that way, but there's a separation. And that's why when the darkness and the confusion swells up and overwhelms us, a higher vision isn't enough. That's when we need to reach the very depth of our spirit, of our real identity of who and what we really are. Not to see a vision, but to be the vision. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, that's what God is saying. We're, we're, we're looking for visions and God's saying, you are the vision if you would just wake up and realize it. Think of, the, again, the patriarchs and Jesus. What were They were visions of what God wanted, His purpose in the earth. They weren't just humans. They were God. Metaphors, they were, they were analogies of God working out in the earth. We think of them as these great and mighty wonders. No, they were screwed up people just like everybody else. But they had a higher vision, and then they became the vision. It said Abraham believed God. He looked not at things that were. He quit looking for a vision and became one. This is my God. I am His. And we are one. And there isn't anything else. Praise the Lord. Jesus, what did Jesus say? I and my Father are one. Blind faith. See, here's the problem with humanity. Blind faith can't grasp truth. Because it doesn't grasp anything at all. I'm talking about blind faith. Intellect can't grasp truth. And that's because intellect is finite and truth is infinite. Only the eyes of the spirit 
the inner, the inner wisdom can grasp the truth. That's the difference between people that are born again and people that aren't. We have grasped a truth that they're trying to understand intellectually that we can't always explain intellectually, but we just know. You can't take away my spiritual experience. You can't take away my, my truth because it isn't something that can be argued intellectually. It's something that's established. It's who I am. Existence as we know it, finitely, is always relative. It's never absolute. I'm talking about from a human perspective. If you think of it, it's always relative. It's never absolute. There's always hitches and glitches and, you know, it's never absolute. And it's why a God life depends on seeing and truly feeling how that applies to you and me. That requires a whole new depth of understanding. I mean, beyond anything we've really tried to tap into from a religious perspective. Look at Colossians 2, 8 through 13. These are some of the same scriptures I talked about last week, but I just want to reinforce what I'm saying here. Uh, Colossians 2, 8 through 13. See, Jesus, they, they, they talk about Jesus. They said, he's making himself God. Well, he's blaspheming. <laughs> it was like he's saying, I am. Well, I, and what do you want me to say? Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Or you could say after the finite uh, understanding of life or, or you know, your, your concept your uh, subjective understanding of, of faith. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Listen, all is all. Fullness is fullness. In him bodily. And you are complete in him. You are the same. In him. That's, that, that's how you identify with what you are and who you are. Which is the head of all principality and power. Which is God. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. We, when we got born again, when we got born from above, we died and were entombed in God's mind. Jesus did, they didn't just do that for something for us to celebrate every April or you know, March. He's, he's giving us an analogy. He's giving us a metaphor for us. Amen. You died. That guy rotted away, doesn't exist anymore, and I gave life, I gave God life, to you, to your spirit man. Amen. And sir, uncircumcision of your flesh shall be quickened together with him. The uncircumcision of your flesh is just simply your body not being given to God, not being given over to God or, or you know what I mean? Because that's what circumcision actually is about, is obedience. Uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, there's no, there is no sin. He didn't just forgive it like I forgive Sally if she says something ugly to me, which is usually the other way around, but I'm just, I want to be about me. So I'm just saying, you know what I mean? It's, it, it isn't forgiven. It doesn't exist. It, and God can do that. It never happened. We say, well, of course it happened. I know I just did. No, it didn't happen. You gotta quit thinking it happened. It didn't happen. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by this. 
You being dead in your sins and uncircumcision and flesh, quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How many, y'all remember, I remember in college, I, I took some art classes. I got grandkids and kids that are, I mean, award-winning artists, literally. They've won some major awards and are really good. Anthony, Tony was a really good artist. Both of his daughters are fantastic artists. His youngest daughter just showed me yesterday she'd gotten a silver uh, key award. Tony had gotten gold key awards, and so had... Uh, uh, yes, I mean, they're just talented. I'm just bragging because I've got grandkids. I never had a skill. I never had a talent for it. I, I had a, a desire for it. I liked it. I liked to look at it. I liked to, I wanted to be able to do it. My older brother, David, the one I was talking about earlier, tremendous artist. I mean, he just, just natural. Never took classes or anything else. Just sit down and he'll draw your picture of you. And it looks like you, you know. Me, not so much. Praise the Lord. Anyway, I took classes, but, and, and I took some art appreciation and, and stuff, too, hoping that since I couldn't actually do it, I might be able to appreciate what other people were doing more. <laughs> so anyway, but my point is this. There was, a, there was a guy, and I can't think of his name right now, but it was called Zoom Art. And if, I'm, if I remember right, it was in the 60s. I know it was in the early 70s when I was in college, and, the, and I, I know I saw it then. I don't know how contemporary it was with that. I can't remember that far back. But here's, here's what it was. Just picture a, this lively scene of children playing ball. Little kids, and they're just out playing ball, right? It's a picture. And it looks real. It looks like a real thing. Amen? It's, it almost invites you into the game, you know, or, or want to be there to participate, right? Until you zoom out to discover that it's only a postage stamp. And it's being posted on a letter by a young man in a very different scene. So what you thought was the picture is actually just a postage stamp. And now the picture is this young guy with an envelope and he's putting the stamp on an envelope because you backed up and saw this bigger picture. Right? And then turns into something that was just painted on a billboard. The guy with the stamp, stamping the letter, you back up and it, and this, this guy is just a picture of somebody on a billboard. And the billboard is right by this highway, like most billboards were, you don't see that many of them anymore, but right next to the highway, right? And the highway then, as you zoom out further, turns out to be nothing more than some little kid's toy cars. You see what I'm saying? It's, it was amazing stuff, but that's, it, anyway, that's called zoom art. So it, then, then it turns into uh, something else, and, and whatever that was, then is lost to a, a yet a wider context and the thing is, each context isn't just bigger. L look at this quickly, Romans 8, uh, verses 10 and 11, and I'll come right back to this. So it isn't that just each one of them is bigger than the last one. You, have, you being dead in your sins, and, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And so back to what I was saying. So the context isn't just larger. That would only render the previous picture to be infinitely smaller or tinier or whatever, right? Instead, each scene provides a whole new frame of reference in which the reality that we were immersed in just one page earlier suddenly and almost mystically is exposed as irrelevant. It's fiction. It wasn't what we thought. And soon to vanish altogether within the even greater context of the next page. There will never, there, there never were any kids. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? 
There weren't any kids playing ball. It was a postage stamp, not a reality. Which means that once you've arrived at this new frame of reference, what you thought you saw never was. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world, right? So think about this. Meaning depends on context. You change the context, you change the meaning. And that which was a reality a moment ago suddenly goes poof. How does that apply to us? How, how does it affect our purpose? What if this new context is not a foreign environment like the frame of a postage stamp? You know, the context of some other frame or reference or uh, some other particular scene. Right? Because we know it didn't even really exist. So what if the new context is your origin? What if the reality of you is your being one with God? And this might be the postage stamp. This might be the freeway. You understand what I'm saying? This is, what, this is the way God talks to us. It's way beyond this, but I mean, this is as close as we can get with a human and to make sense out of it, I'm saying. And I don't know how good a job I'm doing with that, but what if the reality is you? Is your being one with God? The Word made flesh. Your union with origin. Trans, here's what he said. Transcend yourself by connecting to the transcendent. By being, remember the fire? Our God is a consuming fire. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. What can't be shaken? Kingdom. How about being consumed by the fire? In fact, how about being fuel for the fire? We've read that. I've read that and thought that's scary. No, not really, not if we understand it. He spoke from the midst of the fire. His reality was in the fire. We feed the fire. We become one with the fire. That's the whole concept of God in the flesh. Jesus didn't see it as elevating him. But he humbled himself. He didn't see himself as the fire. He saw, him, saw himself as wood for the fire. Fuel for the fire. Praise the Lord. You see, what God is saying to us is we got to look, think, and act differently. And we can't act differently if we don't think differently. And we can't think differently if we don't look at things differently. There you go. I, I, the whole idea of we're looking at the postage stamp and thinking that's everything. We get a little revelation, right? We get some understanding of ourselves and, and our relationship with God. And all of a sudden, the postage stamp kind of fades away. And we see ourselves posting it on a letter. A little more revelation, a little more understanding of God, a little more interaction with God, a little more courage to believe for something else. And all of a sudden, it's a billboard by the freeway. And we're thinking, we're, we're celebrating the revelation, right? We're, we're shouting the victory. Woo! Hallelujah! Look at that. I was a stamp. I'm a billboard. No. Keep looking. Right. Keep listening. The freeway is little kids' cars. It's all a fantasy. The reality is God Amen. and Him only. Amen. Outside of Him, we're fantasies. Yep. 
outside of him were just irrelevant pictures that have no context to reality. And it's in this reality that I'm talking about that Jesus lived and why he was able to do what he did. He recognized his godness, but didn't try to push it on other people, didn't try to parade it around and be more than you, just when it's needed, it's here. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I appreciate your patience with me. Let's, let's, hey, let's think outside the box. Let's think God thoughts. Let's, let's believe to be more than we are. Because if we don't believe it, He can't do it. He can't use us without our cooperation. And the only way we can cooperate is by being one with Him. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Show yourself mighty. Hallelujah. On his behalf. Praise God.